Hello, everyone. I like how I said testing, which was totally just for fun, and it worked. It got everyone's attention. Hi, Cheryl. OK, so first of all, welcome to the Raising Teens in Israel. Um, I know that it's the end of the day, and I'm so excited that you guys were able to stay for this or come for this. Um, we have an unbelievable lineup here today, and I want to make a quick joke. Um, our time is going to be kept perfectly today because I use a Tabata timer. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I'm going to let you know why that's kind of funny. My name is Danielle Salber, and I am a boxing therapist. Now, when people hear that, they're like, what do you mean? You box, right? So I want to do a little activity right now, which is going to take, um, since I just said we have a timer, I have three minutes, OK? So don't worry. If it's really boring, you're going to be like, oh, three minutes. But anyway, I want to do an activity that will let you know not only what this is, which really doesn't matter for right now, but more importantly, to kind of get your minds and your whole being geared up for what we're gonna learn from these unbelievable people here. So, anybody who wants, I'd like to invite you to stand up. We have so much space here, I, I feel it. Awesome. Now, in this moment, I want us all to take, oh, thank you for joining me, thank you for joining me. Okay, now, I would like everybody to take about 10 seconds while I turn off my ringer, 10 seconds to just think back to your own teenage years. Now, some of us might be nicely smiling. Actually, I don't know any of us who might be nicely smiling, but we all have different things that come up. Okay. Now, in this moment, I'd like you to take whatever's coming into your mind, and I want you to take a great big deep breath in with me, okay? We're gonna go like this. Let's all do this together. We're gonna breathe in, breathe in again, and we're gonna just let it out, all the way out. Now that little tool right now, I'd like to invite everyone to please sit down. If you'd like, if you feel energized, you can stay standing, but please sit down. This little tool is just a glimpse of how we can take what it is we're thinking about, what it is we're feeling, and do something physical and mental at the same time to release it. Now, when I said boxing therapist, I really meant it. And this came out of years of working with teens and realizing that there is so much going on underneath the surface. Now, a lot of it has to do with how a person is able to process, or how a teen is able to process their own feelings. And what's going on? All of a sudden, they've reached this new stage. I don't want to spoil too much of what's going to be said here, but they've reached this new stage where they think they know what they're feeling so well, and they want to let it out. And sometimes it comes out in ways where, you know, us as parents or mental health professionals, we're like, oh my gosh, that's kind of hard to deal with. And then that's what they experience. And that's kind of the mirror that they're getting. So a lot of the tools that, that we can do as parents, as mental health professionals, can help to kind of contain all of that so that the development can keep going. So when I use boxing, it's to let expression out. It's to invite the fighter spirit. And not to go too deep into that, but what I invite us all to think about here is how we can each find this within our own selves to invite the other person we're sitting with, whether it's our teenager or our client who we work with, to express the feelings in a way that's safe, to process them, and know what to do with them. That's, it's something we do, and ah, it's, a, it's something we can go into for a long time. Before I take too long, though, I would like to tell you a little bit about who's here on this panel. Um, and what's kind of cool is that in my almost 20 years of working here, I think I've kind of um, really firsthand experienced each of these organizations. I know there's a lot of teen organizations, but these ones here really represent a big portion of kind of the services that we can get here. Um, we have Shana Pagro, who is the director of the Parental Resource Center at Yedidim Epic Families. And she will be speaking first. Then we have Desi Yishai, principal of YTA Girls School. 
we have Gavi Lenkin, the crossroad at LMSW, crossroad social worker, and that actually, I should say, comes very close to my heart because my whole agency work here was with Crossroads, and ah, unbelievable. Zev Gans is going to be our final speaker today, and he is the Rosh Sevet of the Kavla Noor Lamerchav Clinic in Beit Shemesh, although we go way back to the Neve Family Institute for anyone else who was here at that same time. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Shana Pagro to please come up here and just give over the challenges of Aliyah as a teen, a little bit of an amazing way to deal with that, and we're gonna keep going from there. The flow today will start with the challenges and then move into different resources and ways that we can intervene and help our teenagers. We will close at the end with about 10 minutes of questions, so please try and store your questions, maybe write them down, and you'll have an opportunity to ask either any of the panelists or a specific one. So, Shauna, will you please come up? Here you are. We are on time. I need to see it right here. Okay, hi everyone. I'm going to speak specifically about making Aliyah as a teen, and I think the best way to understand what that's all about is to talk for a minute or two about what Aliyah itself is, what it means to be a teenager, and then the intersection of the two of those together. So Aliyah is essentially a relocation to a new place, right? Now, there is a concept of relocation. A person, a family may move to um, a new house within a neighborhood. They may move to a different neighborhood, a different city, state, and sometimes all the way across the country, and then even more so across the world, all the way to Israel. Um, every move is challenging, and moving to a new country is that much harder, which is very understandable because a person is leaving behind their friends, they're leaving behind their family, they're leaving everything that's familiar to them, be it their school environment, their work environment, if we're talking about adults, it's very, very challenging. And when they come to a new country, they have to adjust to a new language, new culture, new societal norms, um, and they have to learn a whole new social and physical environment. Um, and any way you slice it, even a person really wants to come, they really want to make the move, when you get there, it's just not so simple. Let's talk about being a teen for a minute. Every one of us in this room has been a teen, right? And uh, you really started us off with that, taking us back to what it was like to be a teen. And teen, the teenage years are very challenging, both for the teens themselves and for their parents, as many of us in this room know. Um, teens are going through many changes at this stage, physical changes as they're growing and maturing, emotional stages, all the hormones that are raging, mental changes, they're still, their brains are developing and they're not adults yet, even if they think they are, and a lot of social changes too. Their whole environment is changing. Everything that's important to them is different. Um, Eric Erickson defines this stage as a stage where um, a child, a teen, a young adult, adolescence is really trying to define their identity and figure out who they are and, and who am I, what do I want to be, where do I see myself, etc. And it's a very difficult stage um, and there can be a lot of role confusion if, if they don't successfully figure out who they are and who they want to be. Um, on one hand, teens need their parents still, but on the other hand, they don't want their parents at all, right? Because I'm independent, I know better, etc., etc. Um, and their peers are very, very important to them, probably the most important thing in their lives. They care a lot about clothes, about their looks, they want to be accepted. Um, they're working on developing their sense of right and wrong, and in that process, they experiment a lot, and sometimes the experiments may be okay and safe and good, and sometimes they can end up getting into a lot of trouble. Um, without even meaning to, just they're trying to understand who they are and where they fit in and where they belong. So what happens when you take a teen who is already dealing with these issues and you move them halfway across the world? Uh, how, how does this work for them or how does it not work, shall we say, sometimes or many times? Um, first of all, teens often feel very much that they were forced by their parents to come. They didn't want to come. They didn't want to leave the world they were in. They were happy. They had their friends, they had their, uh, their social stature already, and, and all of a sudden, hello, goodbye, and, and that's it. And you may have you know, WhatsApp today or whatever it is, but it's not the same thing. Um, very often, the children, 
no matter how challenging it is, or teens, sorry, we're focusing on, they do start to adjust more quickly than their parents. They will pick up the language. And whatever they do, sorry, it's more than what their parents have done. And basically, what ends up happening is that there's a certain role reversal that takes place because the parents who they look to as a source of knowledge and, and experience and security suddenly are turning to their children and saying, can you help me? I don't understand what the Arnona office wants from me. I need to fill out a form to prove that uh, in America I was a licensed dot, 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 and I don't know what I need to do here. So that, that hierarchy changes beyond the normal of the teen you know, struggles, and, and they don't respect their parents the same way. It becomes very confusing. The last thing I want to say in terms of the parents is parents themselves, as much as they wanted to come, feel unsettled, unsettled as they're trying to discover what is this new world and this new life and what did I sign up for? And children very much will feel that their parents are not settled. And even teens who are so busy trying to be independent really feel uh, that lack of security. And even though they pretend they don't need their parents, as we said, they really, really do need their parents. And when the parents are unsettled, it is particularly difficult for the children who, teens, sorry, who really need stability at this point. And, and that can cause you know, more struggles for them. Okay, additionally, um, as we mentioned before, there are going to be struggles with the language. Maybe they were an A student and they come here. I'm not going to talk too much about schooling because Desi's going to do that. But struggles with language, with culture. All they want to do is fit in. As we said, that's the most important thing to them. And I don't fit in. I don't get it. Everybody else showed up wearing X, but I was wearing Y. Or everybody else knew that it was expected that whatever, and I totally didn't get that and I didn't know it, and there was no one there to help me through that. Um, the last thing, as we said, they have such a need to form their identity, and the opposite happens. Who am I? Am I American? Am I Israeli? Am I an American Israeli? Am I an Israeli American? Am I nothing? Am I homeless? I actually remember my parents made Alian. My young, one of my brothers was in 12th grade, and he didn't come with them, but he was filling out forms to apply to come to Israel to yeshiva, and they one of the questions was address, and he wrote unknown. He, and it was a joke, but it wasn't funny, because he didn't feel that he had a place anymore. So little mini story. OK, I'm trying to wrap up. Um, I just want to put out one more thing there. There's a lot of research on adolescents specifically and relocation, wherever it may be. And um, unfortunately, relocation at this age is, <laughs> can create a lot of crisis for, for teens. Um, they have a much higher likelihood of dropping out of school, elevated levels of delinquency, diminished academic performance, and diminished psychological well-being. Okay, now that I've told you all the negatives, I want to say one positive thing here. Okay? No, I know. What I do want to say is that there is what to do, and there is hope, and there is help. And that's a lot of what you're going to hear from the rest of the panel here. One thing I want to put out that I've seen over time from my experiences is one thing that can help in addition to the other things you're gonna hear about is something called having a mentor for a kid. Now a mentor is really a big brother or sister, but it, what it actually comes to do is it provides a social interaction for a teen at a time where they're very much lacking that social interaction. And that's one of the most important things for them and it helps build them up and build up their self-esteem. And someone likes me and cares about me and I can be myself and then I feel good to begin to make my way into the world at large in this very confusing time. Um, as we said, teenagehood is hard for everyone. This exacerbates it, but there is hope and there are things to do to help the teens. So now I'm gonna turn the floor over to Danielle. Thank you. Shauna, thank you so much. And I so love how you added in something that can help, and it is so right on when you start with the Erickson and whole theory about needing to belong and the peer group. So thank you for wrapping that up. I heard someone say, why make Aliyah then? Um, but to keep this moving, and with amazing, amazing services that really do help this, um, we have Desi Yishai, who is the principal of YTA Girls High School. Thank you. OK. I'm going to um, okay. I'm going to try and speak slowly. You know, teenagers understand on a different frequency. We have to speak really fast and really make lots of movements. So then, I'm going to try and tone it down for you guys. Thank you very much for sticking with us. My name is Desi Yishai, the principal of YTA Girls High School. Uh, we are the only English-speaking high school that will help. Anglos graduate with a full tour that bagrut. I am very proud of the work we do, and I'm very humbled to be part of an incredible 
um, panel, so thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so what is YTA? YTA is a high school, there's YTA boys, there's YTA girls, I'm obviously in YTA girls, and we facilitate people from all over the world, we've got people from America, people from South America, North America, England, Australia, South Africa, all over Europe, I'm definitely forgetting something, uh, and they come to our school and they study in English, and they get their bagriot in English. Now, I just wanna speak about one of the obvious barriers of uh, integrating socially and academically in Israel. And the obvious barrier is the language barrier. It is very, very difficult. As you said, you spoke beautifully. Every word is gold. Um, so very obvious, one of the biggest language barriers, uh, one of the biggest social barriers is language. You cannot uh, you know, understand social cues. You cannot make friends if you don't have the slang. Uh, you come to school dressed one way when you should be dressed a different way. Um, it's very obviously why a language barrier socially uh, is a problem. Academically, you cannot understand how to study when you don't understand the language. And you cannot produce work in the language you don't know how to speak. So obviously, the language barrier is a very big barrier. But I'm going to put that on the side right now, because in my humble opinion, I do not believe that that is the biggest barrier to teen success in high school if you're an Ole or an Ola Hadasha. Um, the biggest, uh, what I see in the hallways of YTA is the biggest barrier is culture shock. And I am nearly 40 and I've been at a wedding with 20 year olds and that is a culture shock. I have been uh, campaign on Cholomoyed Pesach, that's also a culture shock. But really, uh, it's something we just are not used to or we don't know about. But what real culture shock is, is something that is so very, very different to what you are used to and what you expect of a certain society or culture. And that is what happens to teenagers when they come to school in, uh, in high school, when they make Aliyah during high school. Um, it can be as simple and as small and insignificant as it is no longer Mrs. Yisha, it is now Hamora Desi. It can be as overwhelming and scary as, uh, you know, transport all across the country, all across the country at all hours of the day or night at a very, very small price. And let's not even talk about, you know, substances like alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. It is readily available no matter how old the person purchasing it is. So we're not even going to go there. But that's culture shock. Now, what I do is I go around the world. I love to say that it's been COVID two years. I haven't been on a plane. But I do normally uh, participate in expos like this. And I speak to parents that sit across my table that are on pilot trips before making Aliyah. And I always speak about some small thing that I made up in my head one day just at a chance, uh, spontaneous speaking, called the three R's. And this really, really helps understand what we need to do before we make Aliyah or before we look for a school for our teens. Um, and it's just something that maybe you can, you know, tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell a family member that's looking to come here and that may ease, soften the blow, break the fall. I don't know any other bad uh, euphemisms. Okay, it's the three R's. Research, recognize, and rejoice. This isn't, you can quote me, it's just my own opinion. Um, doing research about the high school you want your child to be in is huge. It's hugely frustrating, it's hugely annoying, no one answers phones. In Israel, no one replies to emails. The bureaucratic red tape, as everyone in this room knows, is unbelievably frustrating. But it is super, super, super important because you want to know what kind of kids are gonna be in the school that your teenager is gonna be sitting in. You wanna know if they have academic support for any academic challenges that your child has. You want to know if they offer Ulpan, if your child has zero Hebrew. It it is very, very important. It is very, very frustrating, but it is rewarding and something that you should definitely preempt your aliyah with. Um, number two, recognize. Uh, making aliyah is very difficult. Yes, it's also rewarding and also wonderful and also lovely, but it's a mess and it's very, very hard. And anyone who tells you otherwise either hasn't made aliyah or they're a liar. Aliyah is very, very difficult. Um, and you should recognize that. Teenagers need validation. And just to be heard and understood and say, say something like, I understand that because I'm going through exactly the same thing. I went to work and I totally messed up and I feel so stupid. Um, validation is huge. And just you know, putting, a, you know, putting a label on it is, is really, 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 really helpful. And then to rejoice, to celebrate the small things. I lived for the last 10 years in America and in Hong Kong. We've been back for a couple of years. And three weeks into the school year, I said to my four-year-old, uh, Michali, how was gun today? Just like I said, every single day for the three weeks leading up to that day. And she said, Emma, it was OK. And I scooped everyone up into the car and we went to get ice cream because Michali had an okay day. It wasn't wonderful, it wasn't fantastic, but it also wasn't terrible. And that's celebrating the small things. And every small celebration is another small step in the right direction. And that is really what's important to research, to recognize, 
and to rejoice, to validate and to understand. I'm going to stop talking because there is so much more to say and I don't want to take up time. I should leave as much time as possible for questions. So thank you for listening. Desi Ishai, YTA Girls High School, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I really love that, and I love that you ended on that note about rejoicing and celebrating the small things. I think that is such beautiful advice for almost anything that we're doing in the small progress. It's kind of hard to see some of that progress in Israel, I can imagine, right? When we're waiting for people to integrate, so thank you for that. Um, okay, our next speaker is Gavi Lenkin from Crossroads. Very excited. Hi, everyone. Can anyone see my head over this podium? Yeah, wait, we're going to adjust. I heard yeah. you loud and clear that you needed to do this. Wait. Oh. Israel is about asserting your needs, so you just have to say it sometimes, you know? It's really so it's ready for me after. <laughs> okay, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'd like to speak today a little bit about the concepts of taking a hol holistic approach and a wellness approach to teen mental health. Um, so what is a wellness approach and what is a holistic approach? What does that mean? I know that these sound like fad buzzwords. We're really wondering if there's any significance to them or if they mean anything in particular. But I think they do, and I think it's very important, actually. Wellness includes actively making choices that lead to an outcome of optimal health, mental health, and well-being. Rather than obsessing about fixed outcomes, such as good grades, success on a sports team, or the absence of depressive symptoms, wellness is describing the concept of active choices that contribute to overall physical and mental health. It's not a quick fix, but rather, really, it's a lifestyle choice. And it's a proactive way of thinking about teen mental health instead of the reactive way. I'd like to use a, case, a, a short case example of a teen named Sarah from Jerusalem to help illustrate this point further. Sarah is a 16-year-old living in Jerusalem with her parents and four siblings. Due to a family member's at-risk status, the family was particularly cautious during the peak of the COVID waves and only socialize in person with a few select friends and family members. Now, however, that society has opened back up and the numbers are much better, Sarah's parents have decided that they're comfortable with the kids returning to in-person school and resuming life as normal. However, and I know that Desi can relate to this issue, and we talk about it all the time. However, her parents are starting to notice that Sarah doesn't seem to be going back to her old way of being or the activities that she used to. She infrequently goes to B'nai Akiva and only when her parents push her to go. On Shabbat, she stays home, sleeps through the family meals, doesn't engage with anyone, and doesn't go out to see her friends afterwards. She used to love being part of a soccer chug and now rarely goes out whether it's to go to school. At parent-teacher conferences, her teachers note that her grades are okay or fine, but she seems checked out or not engaged or motivated. While some, maybe a few that I can count on one hand, um, teens might have a balanced mood, an array of different kinds of activities they're engaged with, sports they play, a group of friends that they see actually in real life, I would say that most, especially at this stage in the pandemic, do not. Just like for all of us, adults included, COVID-19 drastically changed the way we socialize, how we spend our time, outside time was limited, social time with friends, was really limited. And for our teens, the way they study was completely overhauled. For many of us, it has been challenging to revert back to how things were before. And honestly, it truly might never really get back there. But I would venture to say that even before COVID-19 changed their worlds, our teens were already spending a lot of their time online, on Snapchat, and online gaming. COVID honestly just accelerated this process and enabled us not to practice our social skills and do outside things and lowered our capacity for wellness. So, our teens can use a bit of an overhaul in terms of how we relate to their socialization, their mental health, and engagement with creativity, which of course influences mental health outcomes. Likely here in this room, we're familiar with the more overt signs that something is wrong. A teen who never leaves his room, not wanting to see friends ever, a teen that makes passive suicidal comments such as, I don't want to be here anymore. A teen who constantly has panic attacks. These are the more overt signs of stress. But I'd like to briefly review some of the less overt signs that a teen's life balance isn't optimal and some changes should be made before there's a significant mental health deterioration. 
More simply put, it's useful to assess for basic functioning. Is your kid sleeping at night, or are they only getting two to three hours, whether it's due to insomnia or being online during the night? Are they eating actual meals, even if it isn't the three square meals a day with a veg and a protein and a carb? Do they have a friend, two or four, that they spend time with and go out with after school? Are they handling classes, or are they just not able to meaningfully engage with them? If they're significantly struggling in school without a diagnosed learning disorder, it's very possible that their overall mental health is contributing to the problem. So now to the important part. How can we offer our English-speaking teens the unique support they need here in Israel? Let's get back to our case of Xera. Is her behavior normal teenage behavior and angst, or is it a sign that she's really just not doing well? I chose this example because it's a classic case that we see at Crossroads all the time and a common enough reality for our teens. While not every behavior should be pathologized, certain behaviors, such as the ones that Sarah is exhibiting, should be explored. While it might take some time for Sarah to adjust to her new reality, it would be important and valuable to assess what supports she needs to help move her along. I would suggest to Sarah's parents to reach out to a professional to share their concerns and get help assessing what's going on. Whether it's reaching out to the school Yoetet or reaching out to one of the English-speaking organizations that work with teens, such as Crossroads or Kavla Noir, it's important to help Sarah get back to a healthy functioning routine, which includes socializing, spending time outside the house, getting fresh air, and engaging in a creative outlet. I'd like to share with you a little bit about Crossroads. I'd be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to do that, so I hope you'll excuse me for doing it. Um, at Crossroads, we've been supporting teens with Alia challenges for 20 plus years. Parents, teachers, and others are always welcome to reach out to us for a consultation and to explore what we offer, which includes free individual counseling, an open after school moadon, a 24 seven crisis hotline, which my husband over there can attest to, a full expressive and creative arts program, including theater, improv, creative writing, and music. Um, I would like to share one final anecdote about a teen who um, made significant process in a process with us over the past few years. Um, some details have obviously been changed. Rachel used to come to Crossroads before Corona shutdowns began and would be an active member of our Moadon. During the height of the pandemic, she began to struggle significantly with depression and anxiety. She started weekly therapy and joined a Corona quarantine group with Crossroads. Once the center opened back up in person, she returned to the Moadon, where she began to make some new friends and have an opportunity to work on her social anxiety. She also became an active member of our theater program, where she had the opportunity to be involved with the acting and production of the plays. Having a space, both online during COVID and in person in our center, she could engage both therapeutically and also in a more informal way, enabling her to strengthen her connections to the people around her and get into a healthy routine. In summation, when you are raising kids in a foreign country, it's so important for them to feel that they have a space that they can really call their own. And if they feel comfortable and engaged with school, that is wonderful. And if that space is B'nai Akiva or Ezra, that's also great. But if your teen is struggling to find a place that they feel supported, not judged, comfortable speaking and developing friendships in English, staffed by social workers, we'd be glad to show them around crossroads and have them participate and what we have to offer. Thanks. Wow, thank you, Gavi. Um, I laughed when you said the hotline because that was my baby. We had, um, oh my gosh, I used to carry around three phones. One was the hotline, one was Crossroads, and one was a bare Miriam, a seminary. But I'm really happy to hear that that's still out there. And I have to say that these services are really wraparound services. And that leads us very nicely into what Zev Gans, Dr. Zev Gans, um, excuse me, is going to be able to go over, which is all different modalities. Um, so here you go. Let's see if we can make this a little more comfortable. You don't have to raise it so much. How about that? There you go. Ah, let's move over. Here's your... Yeah. Great, thank, thank you, Danielle. Um, it's, uh, it's an intimidating uh, um, job to, uh, to have to wrap up this really, really amazing panel. And it was, you know, I, I gained from, uh, uh, from, from listening to these, uh, these amazing women. Um, I, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Zev Gans. I'm the Rosh Tsevet at uh, Lamerchav Kavlinar Mental Health Clinic. Um, our, our clinic uh, 
it was opened uh, two years ago. We provide uh, uh, psychotherapy to the English-speaking population in Beit Shemesh uh, at no cost. Uh, all costs are covered by the Kupat Cholim. Uh, this is a very, very recent innovation uh, that, at least in Beit Shemesh, uh, and really opens up services to uh, uh, individuals, families that, uh, that were not able to access them previously. Uh, we see children, teens, um, and adults. Kavlanor is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, we, see, uh, we see a bit of everything. Uh, I, I'm here to talk about treatment modalities, but really uh, what, I, what this should be called is, is the complexities of treatment modalities with, uh, with, with teenagers. As with everything with teenagers, it's really not simple. Uh, and and there's, there's two major, there's two primary points uh, that, that I'd like uh, to make. Number one is that when we think about psychotherapy with teenagers, we really have to expand our conception of what that means. I'll get into that in a moment. The second, the second thing that, that, uh, I, that we should be thinking about is expanding our definition of what we mean by treatment modalities. And I'll, I'll get to, to, to each of, uh, of, of those in turn. So first of all, uh, typically when we think about adults, when we're having a, a, an issue, uh, when we're struggling with our mental health, uh, when we're having uh, uh, you know, emotional stress. So the classic line is, we'll go to therapy. And that's, for adults, that, that's, that's actually a pretty good idea. Uh, uh, when it comes to teenagers, though, it, it's, it, what, I'd like to, what I'd like us to think about is that it's, it's more complex than that. Uh, primarily, the reason that it's more complex is that every treatment modality, no matter what, whatever letters you give to it, uh, every treatment modality in psychotherapy basically re uh, relies on some level of the capacity to reflect on oneself, right? It relies on, re uh, on reflection, being able to gain insight into oneself. Anyone who's ever met a teen, come in contact with a teen, knows that the one thing that teenagers are really not good at is being reflective about themselves. Um, and, and so uh, putting a teen, is, uh, anyone who's worked with teenagers, knows, in, in psychotherapy, knows that the classic presentation is the teenager comes in, sits down, uh, if they take out their ear pods, uh, then you've already gained something, crosses their, crosses their arms and says, all right, what do you got for me? Um, and, and part of that is because, yeah, it's not cool to be in, in, in therapy, but teenagers are also anticipating a feeling of incompetence, right? When, when we bring a teenager into psychotherapy, we're asking them to do something that they're not good at. Uh, and so... Uh, and, and so when we think about our conception of what it is we're doing when, we, when a teenager is struggling, we really need to expand. And, and the first question we as, as parents, as referral sources should be asking is, is psychotherapy the right modality for this teenager? Are we setting up this child for something that they can't do and will actually entrench and lead it to, to further feelings of incompetence? Uh, so that's the, the first point that, I, and, and I think some of what, what, what was brought up here on this panel is that there are numerous options. We need to think flexibly, whether it's giving a, a mentor, whether it's a, an organization like Cross, Cro Crossroads that's going to do work on the ground, whether it's boxing therapy. Um, uh, th there, are, there are flexible modalities that can be utilized when, uh, when bringing a child to one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy is, uh, is not indicated. Now, wh when we do... When the choice is made to uh, send a child to psychotherapy, the type that we might do at, at Kavla Noir, um, so there's a, a lot of ink is spilled and uh, there, there's a lot of angst about what type of therapy should we be sending a, a child to. And whoever you ask is going to give you the specific type of therapy that they feel that, you know, whatever study they've last read or whatever training that they've done, and parents are usually uh, inundated with lots and lots of different letters, CBT, AAFT, DBT, and it's hard to know uh, what is the, the right treatment modality that, uh, that, that we should be sending our teenagers to. And, and people speak with lots and lots of certainty about their specific type of therapy. Now, the issue here is I, I want to encourage us to, to think very, very differently than that because what the research shows, not just with teenagers, with everyone, uh, is that when, when we look at the, the, the broad meta-analyses, um, the specific treatment approach uh, really matters very little. What you should be looking for is not the type, the, the specific type of approach. We shouldn't, we, we, we really shouldn't get bogged down in, the, you know, my, we need to find an a, a EMDR therapist or we need to find a DBT therapist. What we should be looking, and I, again, I mean, maybe, maybe making some, you know, who, it could be that people are going to start getting upset at me. Um, uh, um, yeah, you could, yeah, <laughs> lay it on me at the, during the, the Q&A. Uh, um, uh, what we should be, but, but what we should be looking for is not the right therapy, but the right therapist. What the research shows very, very clearly is that therapists vary in their outcomes. 
Now, how do you find the right therapist? That's a, another question entirely that I won't get to. I think the last panel was, was, was about that. Uh, but really, we should be look, that's the focus that we should be looking, looking at. Uh, the, is this a therapist who is competent, who is ethical? And also, do we think that this therapist will be right for our kids? Now, what we should be looking at when we think about modalities is not necessarily the specific approach, the, the specific theory of, of therapy, but are we looking, is, is the, the type of psychotherapy that, we're, that we are gonna refer our, kids, uh, refer our kids for, is it gonna be more like an adult therapy or a more family-based therapy? And there are a number of different uh, um, uh, uh, indicators for that. But, but broadly, if a, it, it, broadly w w one thing that we should be thinking about, it, look, one thing we should be looking at is the child's age. Right? Younger children are gonna have, a, younger teenagers, so let's say 12 uh, to 16 are gonna have a very, very, very hard time sitting down in your classic psychotherapy where with, 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 a, with a therapist asking questions and talking. That's gonna be very, very difficult. Um, as, uh, older teenagers, 16 to 18, are going to, are going to be developing, possibly developing the, the capacity to do that more classic psychotherapy. So one question we should be asking ourselves is what type of, the, in terms of the type of therapy, is not so much, again, the approach, but the, but, uh, uh, but the type in terms of is this the, the child's individual therapy or is this a broader therapy? And that's the last point that I want to stress. Even when a child even when a, when a teenager is unable to do that more classic type of, of psychotherapy, we as parents have a lot of influence on, uh, on, our, on uh, 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 where our child's gonna be, how our child is going to, to manage. And <clears throat> working as parents on parenting, on our relationship with our kids, either, with, either together with the kid or, uh, or by ourselves as parents, is often the, 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 um, the, the best um, intervention when we are uh, looking at, at, uh, at working with, with teenagers. Um, with that, I'll stop and, um, and I'll, uh, I'll call uh, Danielle back up. I think you were the most on time, wow. Um, I actually really can appreciate what you said in the looking for the therapist because I get a lot of people that are, you know, saying I don't know how to choose the right type of therapy and I think you pointed out something really important which a lot of therapists don't necessarily say because you don't want to say, yeah, I'm the one, but you're looking for that connection, as you said, which is really important. Um, I would like to open the floor now for questions. Um, and if you have a specific person that you would like to ask, then that, that's also important. I see a hand going up. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Daniel. Thank you so much. And my specific question, with your answer, is how would you speak to your close relatives who are debating making Aliyah with their teens and basically assessing um, if this is right for them and their family and their teens, uh, what types of questions should they as a family be looking into? What should you say? No, we, we actually we made Ali on. We think it's a bad idea for you. you should close one okay, I'm actually going to hand that to Shauna. I heard that. I'll take that and right on. Okay, so that's actually I didn't speak about the organization. I work for it all. You see them now um, at the families. But the question is, if um, I'll broaden it, if people are contemplating making Ali out with teens, how is the best way to respond to them? Okay. So um, it definitely is very individual. I will say it depends a lot on the family, and it depends on the teens. Um, part of the work that I do at BTZ and the families is we sometimes help families pre alia to help them assess if they're coming, is it the right thing to do? And if they're gonna come, how can they um, make it as easy of a transition as possible for their teens, kids in general, and specifically the teens. So what we will try to do is, A, understand why is the family coming, what are they looking for? It's in terms of the teens, and can they really actually achieve that in Israel? It's not so easy. Sometimes people think they're coming to Israel, and it's not that simple when you get here. Um, so it's, a, it's important to understand what they're looking for, but very much to hear about the teen themselves, how they're doing in school, academically, socially, where they're holding, do they have any learning disabilities, um, any struggles that they've had, because sometimes people think, oh, you know, Mishanema Ko, Mishanema Zma, Mishanema Zma, we're gonna pick up, we're gonna move, and everything's gonna be great. And usually the opposite happens, unfortunately. So 
I will want to hear what is going on, what are the children's needs, and then try to, if they're going to come, help them figure out the best places to come to. There's a lot of prep work that can be done that's very important in terms of helping kids. As Desi said, you know, research, research, find the right schools. That's one thing. Also, the community, what's, um, depending on where they're coming from in America and where they want to live here, does it match? Is a teenager going to be able to conform to these new expectations and societal norms that may not fit for them at all? Those are big questions. And who are the kids themselves, and how are they doing in general? And the parents need to really be there for the kids, which is the most important part, I think. And I think someone mentioned that as well. The support the parents give, the approach, the, yes, it's hard, it's hard for me too. Um, that can help, but it, it is a challenge. There's nothing I can say. <laughs> but uh, good luck if people want to do it. Thank you. I appreciate that. So really being able to ask the questions about where they're at, where they're coming from, it sounds like, from what I understood, and then being able to do the research of where that would fit in. Are there other questions? Yes. Okay, first of all, I want to address what you said with the pot and alcohol here. That's just like one issue, because that affects mood and all the things you were talking about with this 16-year-old a little bit. And the other thing I wanted to say about Aliyah is uh, yes. Um, you know, what you said is true. Like, my ex-husband will always say, like, oh, you brought him to Israel, blah, blah, blah. That's not true. Because in all the American communities, they have all these problems also. They have problems in school. They have problems in shul. They have problems getting up on Shabbos morning. They're texting on Shabbos. You know, at least our kids, like, I have to tell you one thing good about Israel. And, you know, we came here because we kind of had to and we wanted to, sort of. But it's like... You're all Jewish, like it's like a Jewish, like if somebody gets hurt in a terrorist attack, my kid is devastated because we're all in it together, you know what I'm saying? And there's like some type of a, a Jewish nationality here, you know? And that's something they don't, you don't really get that in the States. I work with a lot of clients and they talk of, you know, they, they even went to day school and Jew Judaism is just not even, they, they don't, they have second thoughts to marry a Jew then, like, so I just wanted you to address also the pot and the, the... Are you asking a question? Yeah, you said something about pot and alcohol in the okay, high school sure, sure. and blah, blah, blah. I, I mentioned substances, but Every one of the most um, popular school. questions I get is, uh, you know, what's the story with alcohol and drugs in your school? And my answer is always this, um, that it's, some, it's a problem that is in Israel and in the world, and it is across the board. Haredi schools, Chironi schools, anything in between, it is something that exists, and it's something that unfortunately is really available, and that the girls, sorry, the teenagers, have access to should they wish. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, the, the, the hadracha that comes from home, and you know, being careful, in, or, or being responsible, I should say, is something that definitely comes from home, we definitely teach at school, but it's across the board. It's not something specific to the American community, or the Russian community, or any community, it's across the board, uh, internationally as well. Thank you for asking that, I'm glad you cleared that up, and it's more, yeah, exactly, it's everywhere. Um, we can take one more question, and then we need to wrap up. I saw your hand go up right here. Um, I was just going to ask something. Today, teenagers, with social media, with everything that's going on for them, sometimes having a mental health issue is a badge of, not honor, but it's like something to be a bit proud of. It's something to lay things on. And it's very hard sometimes, I would say, there's teenage angst and there's mental health conditions and mental health issues. And where we take, where do you feel, to the panel, like where do you feel we take it when it, those things come up? Like, do we pathologize with them or do we work with the teenage angst in the normalizing place? Great question. Is there someone here who wants to take it? It's a phenomenal question, and I find that in our Ramadan every day, like the kids are just sitting there scrolling through Instagram, being like, I have autism, I have this, I have that, and yes. deciding all the things that they have. Um, and I'm saying it in just a little bit, but it's definitely a reality, and I really appreciate the question. Um, I think like any issue that a teen is bringing to us, coming from a place of curiosity, openness, interest in hearing their thoughts and feelings about it, is the way to go. Um, less about the pathologizing, less about the fixation on the label. Um, obviously, if your school is coming to you and saying, you know, seems like Sarah is struggling with major depression, we should bring her to a psychiatrist and check her, check it out. 
then great, you go ahead and do that. Um, but I think as the parent, that's, that's the first step, right? Coming from a place of open curiosity, just hearing their thoughts and feelings about it, just like you would explore anything with them. Um, but I agree, not getting too wrapped up in the diagnosis, the term, the label. Um, if there is evidence, right? If you're starting to compile evidence that maybe they do have a more significant form of depression because you're seeing this here and you're seeing that there and you're seeing that in school and that in B'nai Akiva, um, then it's important to take that seriously. I hope that answers. Yeah. If you hear the motivation come together, one day, it's right there. Right the right microphone against the speaker. There's a reaction. And accelerates. So as long as the parents are showing their enthusiasm about their life, it's mm -hmm. a joy is contagious. We are telling with joy. <laughs> Thank God we know that you keep in California. They're so lucky and we're so lucky. I don't know if everyone heard you, but I really appreciate that to be able to celebrate our children you almost like be, a USB plug in. I get a bit of a sense, I say, we're so lucky that all kids are not being raised and educated in California. <laughs> and they are so lucky, too, but they don't know it. I'm going to go on for one minute. I'll say one more thing about this. Anyway, so does that mean we have to end? Well, no, it's, so I'm just going to make a, um, I want to, um, I very much identify with what Gaudi said in response to the last question. I think that, that the reason that curiosity is so important uh, is, Whenever we're, we're trying to intervene with teenagers, we have to realize that we're outsiders. Uh, if there's a culture that, is, that, that has been created amongst teenagers, contesting that culture is going to lose every single time. Uh, we are less, we are, excuse me, let me rephrase that. We are not less important, but in, in, on, a, on a, the, the, conscious, the conscious importance in which teenagers identify, we are very much outsiders. It's the second that we take a, a, an oppositional stance against anything that is existing culturally, whatever their social sphere is, uh, we're, we have to expect to lose, and so um, if there is, it, it, it may in fact be that the, this culture of pathologizing, of identifying mental health symptoms is destructive, and yet at the same time we have to accept it and understand it because that is something that is connected on the social level. Is it very fast? Um, I think parents need an education, and they have to start when the baby is two years old, talking on the phone, and we do not WhatsApp, and we do not text. Happy birthday, yeah. Get the connections back. All right, on this note, we do have to keep to a pretty strict time. I want to thank our panelists for being here. I thank all of you as well. And I hope you'll stay. We have another panel coming up right now. So you can keep your seats or keep going.